Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and I'm honored to have uh, today's guest. I don't even know if he knows he's in the right place, so he might have gotten here by accident. But we're here with uh, Steve Gibson. Steve moved to Nashville when he was 19. He started picking up session work. During his years in Nashville as a session player and producer, he's played on over, check this out, 14,000 recording sessions, 150 gold and platinum records, and over 70 number one records. He worked on hits by Alabama, Clint Black. I mean, this list is endless. I've trimmed this down significantly. Alabama, Clint Black, George Jones, Dave Loggins, Reba McIntyre, Ronnie Millsap, Roy Orbison, Elvis Presley, um, Kenny Rogers, George Strait, Randy Travis, Tammy Wynette, Winona, and tons of other people. In 2002, he was nominated to become the very first musical director of the Grand Old Opry, a position he still holds today, some 16 years later. His work in television includes musical direction for the CMA Awards and for the PBS production in Performance at the White House, for which he was nominated for an Emmy. Uh, he was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame and the Nashville Cat Society, which is an elite group of musicians and producers recognized for their creative influence in shaping popular music. He's a four-time inductee into the Cowboy Hall of Fame and Heritage Center, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He's a recipient of the Telly Award as musical director of the Grand Old Opry at Carnegie Hall. He was, uh, he's the MD of the CMA Awards on ABC and dozens of other network TV shows. And he was named the number one working guitarist in Nashville for seven years running by Music Row Magazine. And uh, if you're a baby boomer, then you've obviously seen or heard of the television show Midnight Special. And if uh, you have, I would encourage you to go search online. There's a really cool video clip of Steve backing up singer Dave Loggins, who happened to be his neighbor at the time. And we'll talk about that today. Uh, during a performance of the song, Please Come to Boston, on the Midnight Special in 1974, and Steve was the ripe old age of 21 at the time. He's also a vintage guitar collector, and he was comfortable enough to not wear his uh, sport jacket today, and I appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I'm really honored to have you on the show, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Craig. You're welcome. In 1974, you toured with Lynn Anderson, who had a hit with I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. I was curious if that was your first professional tour and how that came about and what was your experience like doing that? Uh, yes, I started touring with Lynn in the fall of 1972 as uh, just a little supplemental income. I moved to Nashville to be a studio musician. That's what my background was. Uh, I grew up in Peoria, Illinois uh, during a time period when Dan Fogelberg was coming along and also Gary Richrath, Mario Speedwagon and Jonathan Kane. There's a hot pocket there and we had a real recording studio there uh, called Golden Voice, which is how I got started. But when I moved here, um, the, uh, the, I started and I came in playing sessions and the Lynn job came up uh, as a, just a function of somebody who quit. And I got a call from a keyboard player friend of mine. He said, you want to go out with us on the weekend and do this? So I said yes. Um, it was the first time I'd ever been on a commercial airliner. First time I'd <laughs> done a lot of things. <laughs> first time you were on a plane. Yeah, first time. Well, I, was, I was actually on a small plane as a child. But uh, this, <laughs> this was a, a, a real big deal. And I, I recall going to New York City and, and being a, just a, a you know kid from the Midwest. And, uh, so it's like a Crocodile Dundee oh, moment. Hey, look at that. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, that, that relationship lasted until Lynn's death. Um, she was a very big star at that point mm. uh, and was, people tend to, this has been a long time ago, so it's easy to lose sight of the fact that Rose Garden was an enormous pop hit record as well as a country record. And she was doing all of the major network variety shows in that time, playing for presidents and working with Bob Hope and everything that was high profile. So it was a first class gig and I was eternally grateful. A few years later when Lynn and her husband, Glenn Sutton, separated, they came to me when I was 26 and said, would you produce Lynn? So she became one of my first successful record production relationships as well. Um, At 26? I, yeah. 
And wow. it was 25 or 26. And so they <laughs> go figure, you know, they gave me the keys to the candy store and said, we trust you. And, and, uh, um, she opened a lot of doors as did her husband, Glenn, who was a remarkable, uh, songwriter. It's another topic all on its own, but if you ever look up Glenn's name, you'd be astounded at all of his accomplishments. Lynn remained a true and dear friend uh, throughout her life. We, uh, I didn't stay with the with uh, the touring thing much longer than '74. Uh, it actually started in seven, late '72, but then uh, I was out because I was getting so busy playing sessions that session work was actually encroaching on the weekends and times when. Uh, she was traveling. So uh, she's one of those people that opened up a lot of doors and gave a kid from Peoria, Illinois. Uh, she showed great faith and great trust. And um, I'm sorry she's gone. She really was a special person to me. Yeah. That's, a, I, I, that's just amazing that you were doing that at such a young age. <laughs> that's really cool. <clears throat> Okay, so from, and now my next question was related to what you just said. My, uh, your first gig with her was playing at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> what was that like? I mean, you must have been like a deer in headlights. Oh, I was. It was uh, remarkable. As I said, I'd never been on a, never been on a commercial jet before. Uh, and uh, flying in in the limos at the airport and driving down um, 7th Avenue and, you know, craning my neck looking up going, <laughs> golly. <laughs> Uh, and I, I do recall uh, that um, after we played that gig, we went and caught a flight and f went to uh, California and played the Santa Anita Raceway mm -hmm. the next day. And I doubled on banjo for a couple of songs on that show. And I got to the Santa Anita Raceway and opened my case up and the neck was broken oh. <laughs> on the banjo. But it, it was it was pretty heady stuff for a kid. Um it was wonderful. It was a, a magic time when um, everything was done in a real first-class manner. She was great, had wonderful bandmates, and uh, we played all kinds of things. We did everything from rodeos to uh, uh, society balls and uh, television. It was just a wonderful time, big stuff. How did you process all this at a young age? I mean, because – to take all it, it's a lot of stuff to take in for a young kid. <laughs> we were chatting earlier, and I'll quote myself again I, when you're young, you do things because you don't know you're not supposed to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And I came to Nashville, and it never occurred to me that I wasn't going to succeed at what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I now know that that was, uh, I look back on that now through the eyes of wisdom, and I go, Well. <laughs> I sure got lucky, I guess, but again, I, I don't think anything happens purely on the clock. I think there's purpose behind everything, but the matter of processing it was more about um, trying to be a sponge and soak up every moment of everything I could soak up. Um, I had been playing guitar since I was 12 years old. First time I went in the studio, I was 14. I had been making re regional records and and I, I knew which side of the microphone worked when I moved to Nashville. I had a session the first day I came here because I had some relationships in the business based on that. But you, you process it by looking at it. And, and everyone who does have that kind of an experience, I think, goes through a period of going, well, there's nothing to this. <laughs> this is easy. And, um, and, and it, it's, I was fortunate that I had great mentors who kept me grounded. That's what uh, I was wondering more. Like, yeah, the, the head stuff. Like, because it's you know, you're 22, you got the world by the balls. In that situation, you're like, you're a rock star, effectively. Well, I, uh, I I never aspired to be at the front of the stage. Um, I always intended to be a studio musician or a producer or a guy on the back line. Um, I never had the the gene. Uh, or the, it wasn't in my DNA anyway, to want to be a performing artist. Um, so I didn't have that problem to deal with. But I, I had, Lynn was a great mentor. Her husband was a wonderful mentor. The people who sponsored me when I first moved to town, who I would be remiss if I didn't mention a guy named Bob Millsap, who also uh, uh, brought a songwriter named Randy Goodrum to town, who if you look him up, you'll find he's had a pretty good career. Um, 
and um, also another guy named Buzz Kaysen. Uh, Buzz Kaysen is another one you'll have to look up, but he wrote a little song called Everlasting Love. Mm. With Mac and uh, so these people were 10 years older than me. So they, in some ways they were like older brothers, but in many ways they were surrogate parents. Mm. Uh, they were well-grounded, good people, and they made sure that if I got a little bit out of line, they took me in the corner and dusted off the seat of my pants and said, don't do that again. Now go back over, sit down, and do what you do really well. And uh, wasn't a perfect, by no means was it a perfect yeah. same process. Yeah, but you sounded like you, fortunately, as you said, that wasn't in your DNA. You you seem like you're, you've always been like, basically, that's a pretty focused you know, focus on your career and, and focus in on the process and absorbing as much as possible. From the time I was, I had older brothers. Let me just set this up by saying I had older brothers. And so I grew up listening to music in our household. My dad was from Kentucky. So he brought Cowboy Copas and Bill Monroe and the Leuven brothers. And he brought that grounding, Flat and Scruggs. Hmm. My brothers brought the Ventures. They brought uh, um, Buddy Holly. They brought... I heard all of this music in our house all the time, even though no one was really musical. My dad taught me a few chords, but everyone loved music. And um, uh, so it, it really was something that I don't know why, uh, who can explain this stuff, but from the earliest age, I would sit and listen to what Hank Garland played on an Elvis Presley record. You know, so it was I'm just not, about the music. It was just about the music. And for some reason, the connection happened early and strong and was decisive. And I, again, I recognize now that's a gift that very few people are given mm. in this life. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, and because of that, you know, I, I just, it's all I ever wanted to do. I was very focused on the music. I kind of knew early on what I didn't want to do. And uh, it never occurred to me that I was going to move back to Peoria. <laughs> Good for you, man. Thanks. You also played on an album produced by George Harrison. I was curious what the backstory to this was and what was it w like working with and interacting with George. And also tell the, tell the suit story, man. Uh, it's <laughs> – well, by that point, I had, uh, I had already played on a few hit, big hit records around town. And during the 70s, Nashville was uh, – uh, Rodney Crowell was once quoted as saying that Nashville in the 70s was like Paris in the 20s. And there was some truth to that. Nashville in the 70s was a magical, marvelous place where I met and, and worked alongside Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt, and of course, my dear friend Dave Loggins, and uh, uh, the, the list goes on and on. Mickey Newberry, all these terrific artists. And along the way, then we discovered that we could cut some pop records and have some hits. So um, that happened, too. And then I befriended uh, on Please Come to Boston. Mm. The bass player on that session was Norbert Putnam, mm. who has been a lifelong friend. Norbert and his partner, David Briggs, were the renegades early in Nashville in the 60s and 70s. They were the guys that played on Elvis Records and when the monkeys came to town. They did it all. But they had come up from Muscle Shoals. And uh, and I like to share stories of my colleagues, too, because it's, it's yeah. all in because it's all interwoven. If you pull on a string, the whole thing's going to come unravel. That's how for sure, man. Likely we are. But I met Norbert and got to know Norbert, and we worked together. Uh, he produced Dan Fogelberg, John Baez, Jimmy Buffett. The list is endless. He uh, got a call from uh, one of his relationship people at, at uh, I believe it was Warner's, Warner Brothers Records, where George had his Dark Horse imprint at the time. And they offered him uh, this project to do with George. Um, and so he took me and uh, Kenneth Buttry played drums. Um, David played piano. Um, gosh, who am I missing here? Norbert played bass. Songwriter named um, Parker McGee went along. And in any event... He asked me if I wanted to go to uh, England and make this record. Um, I was 20. That was, to, let's see, I would have been 20. I was 25 when that happened, I guess. Wow. Yeah. And so I got there and working with George, you know, I was 25. The Beatles were still very fresh in my memory. And uh, we were. They weren't much older, though. They were probably like maybe five, six years older. That's it, right? Maybe, maybe. Uh, 
Well, I'll tell you. Here's the way you can count on it. George had T-shirts that said, uh, I'll turn 33 and a – I was born in 45. Uh, I'll turn 33 and a third in 78. <laughs> Which, which I didn't, I don't have one of those, and I so wish that I did. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we uh, we worked at Friar Park. We uh, stayed in a, a little inn in uh, the village there, Henley on Thames. And uh, again, you do things because you don't know you're not supposed to. Although I was scared, it was a, a nerve wracking experience at first. Surrounded by all of the the history and the culture of the Beatles, Ravi Shankar's nephew was the second engineer. <laughs> so it's pretty intimidating there. Uh, sure. Well, it was like this is going to be interesting. Let's see what happens. <laughs> but again, you charge on, you do the job at hand. And, and there were a couple of fellows um, in this band called Splinter that were from Scotland, or yeah, they were Scottish. And George was there. We went out to Friar Park and. Of course, George was astounded. He already knew about us all. George was a student of music, and and he couldn't have been kinder or nicer. Um, and we went out, and uh, um, he was astounded at how fast we could write a number chart out and be playing a song. And he just couldn't hang with us, you know. He just couldn't do it, and he knew that. So it got to the point where he would, uh, we would cut all the tracks, and then we'd go into London to raise hell on the weekends, and George would put on his guitar parts. Which, of course, I didn't miss the opportunity to say, now, how are you doing these slide parts? <laughs> uh, one day he took me down the hall and uh, he opened up a door and he said, have some fun here. And there in the room were all of the guitars. It was the Magical Mystery Tour strap, wow. the uh, Ramirez, the And I Love Her, and, and, and the Gretsch Country Gentleman. They were all there. He said, just put them back when you're done. And on the way out the door, he looked at the Les Paul, and he said, uh, I, I said, what's the story on this? And he said, oh. He said, well, he said, Eric got Patty, but I got the Les Paul. Wow. So you got the Les Paul. Wow. So while well, my guitar gently weeps. Yeah. And that was his sense of humor. He was a very, very funny guy, you know. Wow. And very the goal, cool, I want to hold your hand, was uh, putting it delicately is when you use – the restroom and sat down, <laughs> closed the door, and there was the, the gold record for I Want to Hold Your Hand. You're kidding me. That's so funny. No. No. Wow, that is really funny. Oh, he, he had a, just a wicked sense of humor, and he was wonderful. And then it finally, we all got warmed up, and you said tell the story, and I also cautioned you about cutting me off if I ramble, but um, I was always been kind of a serious dog most of my life. Even in high school, I wore sport coats and you know didn't wear ties and stuff. But I just kind of liked to, you know, I didn't, didn't like to look like a rat all the time. Uh, so uh, the first thing I did when I hit the ground in England was I thought, there's going to be some new clothes in my closet when I go home because I may never get to do this again. So right. I immediately went and I found a men's clothier and I bought an Inverness cape, you know, my Sherlock Holmes cape, and I bought this. Cool. One's tooth. Uh, An Inverness cape. <laughs> I still got that. That's in the closet right next to me right now. I think pounds to jacket in question. Maybe we could use that as a pick for the interview picture. Get a picture. <laughs> Give me a picture of that. Yeah. You and your Inverness cape with a with a yeah. pipe or something. I came in wearing the cape and the hounds tooth jacket and and there was a, there's a solo on one of those songs, uh, and I don't remember the title. It is on YouTube, you can find it. Um and so I had a, a, a Les Paul that had been custom made by Gibson, one of just a couple they made that were three pickup Les Pauls, but it was white. Mm. And so I took that with me, and uh, and we were using that, and I put on this like screaming guitar solo, and George turned around and said, "Is Clark Kent?" <laughs> and the reference being obviously that I should be like the part of a of a screaming electric guitar player because I'm standing there in my sport coat reeling this thing off yep. and it stuck. And so everybody wrote Clark Kent on all of my, uh, cartage cases and everything. <laughs> that was George's nickname for me the rest of the time that we were there. Clark Kent. That's awesome. Yeah. So it sounded yeah. like you had a, you had a, it was a really good experience. It's a tremendous experience. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a one in a lifetime experience, but the relationship with George lasted past that. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Norbert, and I and our, our wives went back uh, the following year and went up to Friar Park and, and celebrated New Year's Eve with George and Olivia. Oh, wow. Danny, Danny had just been born, 
And uh, I stayed in touch with him, <laughs> had his phone number, would call him occasionally and say, what's the story on this guy? And, and we remained in touch until George withdrew after uh, Lennon was killed. Wow. That's, that's amazing, man. What, what, what did you, was there any takeaways from working with him? Like, what did you learn, if, if anything, in, in that time you were with him? I learned not to be intimidated in the presence of a legend because it turns out he was just as nice a guy as anybody could ever ask for. He was kind, he was funny, he was engaging, and he turned out to be, all, unfortunately for too short a period of time, a friend that I considered to be someone I could talk to. Hmm. Um, I came away with uh, the sense that you got to always bring your A-game. Bring A-game. You know, if you're going to go down, go down in flames. They may tell you, you may play something you think is incredible, and they may say, eh, I don't know. Well, I don't know. What else you got? That's the life of a studio musician, though, is you want to sit there and go, you got to be kidding, man. I just threw you my fastest fastball. You just got the, no, yeah, doesn't work. And sometimes you can do that, though, and you knock it out of the park. Mm -hmm. And somebody engages it and calls you Clark Kent. <laughs> well, you've knocked it out of the park uh, like 150 golden platinum times. <laughs> so I, I think, you'd, I think you know, you've done all right there, man. Thanks, man. Uh, I mentioned earlier Dave, Lo and thank you for sharing. That was a real nice story. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Dave Loggins was your neighbor, and from what I understand, it was actually like a cool community of musicians where you lived. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of that and what the best part of that experience was. Sure. Going back to that business about Nashville in the seventies was that uh, we lived in a little community adjacent to the Vanderbilt Unity, uh, Vanderbilt University campus, and. It was a small wedge of property with streets, main streets all around it. And it was a bit of a little bit of an artist colony. Um, some of the folks who were there speak of this. There was one local bar, our neighborhood bar was called Bishop's Pub. And it was the watering hole for everyone to come in. But in that area, Dave lived over there, Guy Clark. Um, who I befriended and got to play on his old number one album, which is, a, was a, looking back, these are all great honors. But this community was a place where we had, in that little residential area, we had students, we had old retired people, we had bikers, we had photographers, we had artists, we had songwriters, musicians, singers. And it wasn't uncommon to... Uh, for, you know, we're all young. Everybody drifts by and hangs out a little bit. And somebody says, hey, what do you think about this? I'm working on this song. Or I got this song. I need a little lick. What do you think? Uh, Logan used to call him a chop. He says, Davey, play me a chop. And, um, and so Please Come to Boston was written in part uh, at, in the living room at my little place. And Dave lived <laughs> next door. And... Uh, um, <clears throat> Dave had already had one album released on Vanguard and he had already written uh, a song uh, called Till the World Ends for Three Dog Night um, this guy threw away lyrics that most people would kill to think of and write down and he was that brilliant and so he got a deal with uh, Columbia and um, because we were neighbors and we worked up this arrangement on Boston and on a couple other songs, there's another song on that album called Sunset Woman that is pretty cool. I was always real proud of that solo because I was just a kid, didn't know. But I was emulating Chet, playing, Chet Atkins playing his Del Vecchio, mm. which comes back and maybe we can talk about it, how it's all a big melting pot. We all borrow from each other. Mm. Anyway, that's how Dave came about. He invited me to be on the sessions. Uh, that was uh, on that project. Again, was David Briggs, Norbert Putnam, Jerry Kerrigan played drums, Billy Sanford played the electric guitar solo. I played all the acoustic parts and the high third guitar parts. Um, uh, what does else? that mean? I'm sorry, high third guitar parts. I've never heard that. Oh, okay. I, yeah, by all means, stop me. There's a. In Nashville, a long time ago, in order to thicken up the acoustic guitar parts, someone came up with the idea of replacing the G string uh, with something like an 8 or a 9 gauge string and tuning it a full octave above the traditional G. So it would be like G on the E string at the third fret. Right. 
because 12 string guitars just simply don't record well. They take up way too much space in the sound spectrum. So that was the first use that I'm aware of, and it was probably one of our guys like Ray Edenton or uh, um, or Grady Martin, one of those people that were the founders of this whole thing. The high third guitar gives you the open E and B, and then the third, and then a lot of guys just left the remainder of the string set tuned normally. Then it evolved to a point where we just regaged the strings, rethought the gauging, and then everything from G D, A, and E were up an octave. Oh, okay, interesting. Half of a 12 string. And when you combined that with a six string guitar, uh, you had the sonic equivalent of a 12 string, but in a much more manageable way for the engineers and the mixers. Oh, I never heard that. Thanks. That's interesting. And now, they, they call that a high third. Well, you can call it a high string guitar. High string guitar. Really a high cool. string guitar. But it started as a high third string, and then it evolved to the high strung guitar. Okay. What it also does, though, is uh, it makes for some incredibly cool patterns where you would pick, and you can play the same pattern you play on a regular guitar, but when the voicings get inverted, some notes go up an octave, some stay down in the standard range, and pretty soon you get this real crystal snow falling from the sky kind of effect uh and that's part of what's on that record. If you listen close, you can pick it out, and you'll hear it. And it makes for this marvelous little icing on the cake that's a nice alternative than just going bang, bang, bang on a second pass of straight-up acoustic. And I never heard th- I never heard that. Thank you for uh, explaining that. That's why I like these. I learn something new every day. So... <laughs> so- so, so were these these like apartments that you were in, basically, or like? Dave and I started out living in an apartment um, very close to this uh, little artist colony thing. We were next to our neighbors, and that's when Boston was written. But we both ended up moving over to uh, this other area uh, shortly thereafter. What is that so, area now? Uh, that area is now a parking lot for Vanderbilt University. <laughs> <laughs> It's not like a 12 sided house. We used to call it the roundhouse. It was like a little uh, dodecagon house that I think was originally planned as like a lake house for people. And somebody had built two of them right there on a lot. And I, you know, remember this is 72, uh, 73. And I said, I got to live there. That's cool. Yeah. So it was empty. And so the roundhouse became uh, a gathering place for so many of us to come. It just was. Yeah. And, uh, uh, it's all gone. Um, time moves on. The wheel moves around. Sure, sure. But for a moment in time, it was the place where you could hear Steve Earle sing demos and Towns Van Zandt would come wandering in. And at the same time, somebody, Susanna Clark, Guy's wife, was a painter. She actually, on the old number one album cover, that's her painting of one of Guy's old denim shirts oh. hanging. So you never knew what was going to happen. You know, people wander by, knock on your door at midnight. There was no reason to be frightened. Sure. It's kind of like a Greenwich Village sort of scene in Nashville. It was. And um, and, and a, a bohemian kind of an experience. Mm. And, uh, we had a lot of fun. It was a great place to sit and be young and to listen to music. Um, the Roundhouse, I had a... I could afford to have a pretty good stereo system, so naturally I was a popular destination to listen to what was new. So you get out of the record store and wait till midnight when they uh, officially uh, put the record, the new whatever it was, in the bin, and okay, let's go back to the house. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember those days. Um, I was wondering, you've worked with so many cool people. I want to just throw out a few um, projects that you worked on. If you could talk about maybe how you how the gig came about and uh, a cool or interesting story about working with them. First one is B.J. Thomas, 1975. Another Somebody Done Somebody Wrong song. What a great... All these tunes are like really cool that we've been talking about. It was, this is back in the day. It's kind of funny how back in the day, AM radio and early FM, where you could hear like a whole conglomerate yes. of things. It wouldn't just be, well, right. that's country, that's no, this, right. that's... You know, you'd hear... You get a good music education just by listening. Oh yeah, you get Johnny Mathis next to Johnny Cash. Right, right next to Johnny Rotten. You know, yeah, right. <laughs> it was so cool. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, well, again, by that time I had uh, managed to kick up some noise, and I was a new kid in town, and and uh, 
the, the long version of this, um, Chip Smoman, who was the the uh, grandmaster of the American rhythm section in Memphis and had, had just such a phenomenal, extraordinary career with a group of phenomenal, extraordinary musicians and talent and arguably helped change the face of popular music. Um, when he left Memphis and all of the guys, meaning Bobby Wood, Bobby Emmons, Tommy Cogbill, Mike Leach, Gene Chrisman and Reggie and Johnny Christopher, uh, Johnny Christopher was the acoustic guitar player in that, that group, and you probably know this. They all tried to find a new home. Chips had finally just had enough of Memphis, and I think they all realized uh, that it was time to move on. Uh, just a quick aside, one time Reggie was quoted as saying, somebody said, man, that, you guys are the best thing to come out of Memphis. And he said, no, the best thing to come out of Memphis was I-40 East. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think from what Reggie said, they were like, you know, and we kind of talked about this before the call. It was like a pretty corrupt sort of, you know, yeah. like you, these people seem like sort of like spiritually bankrupt that were sort of the running the show. And these guys were cranking out to hit after hit and for basically nothing. Yeah. And they were just like done with it. You know, well, I know this. I know some of the stories, but Reggie and the rest of the guys lived the experience. Yeah. But they relocated to Atlanta, hmm. and there was a period of time when, when I first moved here in 72, Reggie and the other guys, except for Bobby Wood, were still in Atlanta, as I recollect. It's been 46 years ago. That's so, correct. That's correct. You know, I, I, I want to remember this correctly. Um, there was a point in time when, for some reason, Chips decided he wanted to try some different musicians. Hmm. And Bobby Wood, who was wonderful to me, he got me on all kinds of R&B dates because Reggie wasn't here and, and uh, Eddie Hinton would come up from Shoals. But he put me into the Buddy Killen. I'm wandering here a bit on you, Craig. But the Buddy Killen deal, when Buddy was producing Joe Tex and uh, uh, in all these R&B acts for Dial Records. And he also owned the sound shop. And, and he was also originally from the Muscle Shoals, Quad City, Alabama area. All right. So there's nobody else. So let's take a chance on the new kid. And... And what nobody knew is that I had grown up in Illinois. It wasn't exactly like growing up in the middle of nowhere. I had Chicago radio. Uh, I had Memphis radio. I had Cincinnati radio. And, and being a, a, a complete sponge about music, um, I was already real up to speed on R&B. And I loved it because R&B, boy, in my heart, it's sitting right there with at the top of the list of what strikes me emotionally. Mm. And I understood it and I researched it and I studied Curtis Mayfield and I studied, you know, the list goes on and on. But what, what a so great, I, great guitar. What a great artist Curtis oh Mayfield, God, yeah. by the way. You yeah. know, I didn't mean to cut and you off, but he's I mean, uh, All awesome. the guys in, in Detroit, uh, all the guys in New York, there have been so many wonderful guys. But back to the point is that I understood this music. So I got kind of, that was the, the way in through the door. Then when, when chips started to hire me for things, um, I, I don't know why Reggie wasn't there, but there was a period of time when I was doing projects with chips that Reggie wasn't there. I was the electric guitar player. Um, that happened to be one of those times. That was one of those days that we were doing BJ. Um, I was the electric guitar player. It was a hit song. You never know. I don't care what anybody tells you. When you're in the process of making a record, you no one can tell you if it's going to be a hit or a miss. Been fooled so many times, both ways. We all have if we're honest about it. But that was where I was. I was playing uh, an SG, uh, a SG special. But I got for Christmas in 1964. I was going to ask you, is that the one you got? Because I saw some interviews of you talking about that SG very lovingly. Very lovingly. I, that was uh, that was the guitar I used. Um, I also don't understand why my memory is so good, but it's pretty good. At least my deep memory. I'm not sure. <laughs> what did you have for dinner last night? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's how that happened. And then, you know, it went on for a while. And when it went away, it went away. Yeah. And uh, But Chips was always trying to shake things up a little bit. And I think his school was to as we discussed earlier, was sometimes it was to wear people down to their common, their simplest common denominator. 
and provide an opportunity to sit. And while you got all the spare time, by the way, you're sitting there noodling until Chips had great ears. And when he heard something, he'd yell, stop. And um, that was my recollection. Reg may have a totally different take on this because, like I said, he lived it. But I lived it in part, and that was my take on how that Sure, happened. sure. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever been in a situation where you played on something and you said, holy crap, this is going to be big, and it was? Probably. But 14,000 sessions times three songs a session. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Don't try to get out of this. <laughs> that's not a good excuse. 42,000 songs. Come on. That's ridiculous. I'll, you could plug one. <laughs> I'll cite you one that I, I thought that I played on that I, that I said, this is this is this this doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell. And I was really wrong about it. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just can yeah, I say yeah, 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 of course, actually, open door, man. Back in 1983, I believe it was 83. Um, Columbia Records closed down all their recording studios. There are uh, conflicting stories about why this happened, but the truth happened is that they were having uh, labor disputes with the IBEW over their engineering departments. Interesting. Uh, RCA had the same problem, and everybody closed their own and operated studios at about the same time. Columbia owned, uh, had acquired uh, and owned the original Owen Bradley Quonset Hut studio over on Music Row. And it was a magic, wonderful place. I'll use that term a lot because they were. They were, they were like being in a just a very special environment where, where wonderful things happened and things came out of the walls and the floors and bounced around and you tried to catch it. So we were working with a new artist. He was on Mercury. He was produced by a guy named Frank Jones. I was booked for a 10 and a 2. Fred Carter Jr. hired me for the sessions. And we walked in and um, the artist's name was John Anderson, country artist. And uh, at the end of the two o'clock session, we had, you know, that, that same old deal that we heard a lot uh, from producers, which is, hey, we've got about 15 minutes left. And rather than them cutting you loose for an early out, they would Imagine always say, that. <laughs> Stick more in, you know? <clears throat> and uh, somebody, kinda, and usually that would lean over the, the top of the hour time. Somebody said, yeah, well, we just got to be done by five today. Okay, great. So we have one more quick song, it's a little song that John wrote, and we'll just knock this out. Well, the song was a song called Swingin'. <laughs> and it was a million-selling record. It was a number one record. It was just a fun, simple little ditty of a song. When we finished it and listened to the playback, the manager, as I recollect, it was the manager of the studio, this fellow named Norm Anderson, who came in, and with Frank Jones, they said, have an announcement to make if we could get your attention. You've just played on the final record to be recorded in this studio. This is the end of the road for Studio B, for the Quonset Hut, and for the uh, Columbia Recording Studios as owned and operated studios. So, and of course, at that time, we had no idea what would happen with Swingin', but one thing was that I just unknowingly participated in a historic event. And second was, is I was so proud of that record and John and everybody, including that old studio, for throwing one last great big haymaker punch. Yeah. Very Let's cool. Let's go out with a million selling record. It was great. It was as if that studio said, you can put me down, but you're not going to forget me. That's awesome. Really yeah. cool. Very yeah. good experience. Talk about... England, Dan, and John Ford Coley, 1976. I'd really love to see you tonight. Started with my dear friend Kyle Lenning, a uh, treasured friend of mine who was an engineer that I got to know. Uh, we're both kids. Kyle's a couple years older than me, but it doesn't matter. We're all kids. We're all kids when we're musicians anyway. And Kyle and I got to know each other, and uh, he wanted to become a producer, and he certainly had the knack for it. He's a brilliant engineer. And so... We were pals, and uh, we started with recording this at a studio out north of town in a guy's basement. It's called Studio by the Pond, and the guy who owned it was Lee Hazen, who was a, another name that uh, was so active in Nashville and an important engineer guy. We pulled together a group. It was uh, Shane Keister on piano. Ted Reynolds played bass on that. Bobby Thompson played acoustic guitar. Larry London played drums, and I played electric. 
Dan Seals played left-handed, upside down and backward. And Danny had yet another variation on the Nashville high strong. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He played left-handed, upside down and backwards out of necessity or what? They just learned how to do that. So he took a 12 string and he left the middle two strings doubled up, right, in octaves. Mm -hmm. He only played, a, he only strung up a single E and B and A and E. So his G and D were doubled up. Now he's playing this in a conventional tune, a conventional uh, format, uh, linear format of tuning. He's playing it like this, moving a little bit, but he's playing it like that, and he's playing all the chords upside down. What? Just like on a like for a challenge or like what? I mean, with, well, I think with... it's just how he learned to play the guitar. Wow. Okay. Dan was one of the kindest and sweetest guys in the world. He's uh, related to uh, uh, Jim Seals, Seals and Cross. Yeah. And he was uh, cousins uh, to uh, a country singer named Johnny Duncan. It was a musical family. So they came in. Danny was a Texas boy, and he was really kind of country at heart. But they had been playing all through Texas in different bands and things. And the songwriter I, me I mentioned earlier, Parker McGee, who went to England with us for George, yeah. Yeah. had written – he was cool. And he wrote these kind of cool pop, light AC records. And uh, that was a growing trend in Nashville. Norbert had broken through with some of those – big hit records and uh, everybody in Nashville said, what are they doing? And everybody in LA said, what are they doing? Because <laughs> uh, it was just one of those interesting things. Um, we were cutting hits what we were doing, but we weren't doing it in a way that anybody recognized how, and we didn't know how. Hmm. So Danny and John came in and we cut, I think three, four sides maybe. And uh, the record deal uh, was done. It was on big tree records uh, owned by Doug Morris. And, uh, so Kyle and I, being young and being guitar geeks and him being a technical geek, we started dabbling. That's a 55 Stratocaster. Uh, the head end was a Herzog. And then I amped it through a, about a 54 Fender Deluxe amplifier. Do you still have these, either one? Uh, yeah, I've got them all. Really? You have both the 54 Fender Deluxe and the 55 Strat? Yeah. Wow. That um, is, that's magical, man. Yeah. Uh, I've tried to hang on to as many instruments as I can. And unfortunately, those I've lost have largely been stolen. Uh, I've traded a few away, but theft was a big deal, as it is in any guitar town. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's the same problem in, in, uh, uh, in uh, any guitar city where that's going to happen and things are left in studios, but I digress. But Larry London had just gotten the set of the uh, tunable toms, the Hal Blaine Octo Tom set, you know, uh, that was so popular for a minute. And um, Parker wrote the song. We came in and we recorded it. And uh, then Kyle and I kept tinkering with guitars. And so I was just driving the living daylights out of that little amplifier because the, if you're familiar with the Herzog, it's like the front end of uh, Princeton. Hmm. Herzog is a Randy Bachman deal. It's a Canadian. Okay. And, and uh, Reg used to use one as well. Reg and I were the only two guys in town that had them. Um, and so we were just, the poor little amp was screaming for mercy. <laughs> and, uh, and so we kept trying these things. And this is long before we had uh, a lot of, uh, of, of software gimmickry. So I put on a part and then we'd slow the tape machine down a little bit. And we'd put on another part, or I'd detune the guitar, put on another part. And then we'd put on a harmony part, do the same thing. And then we'd have to bounce things down. Before you know it, we were trying to invent these things that were, were like structured parts. And some of the inspiration came from Louis Shelton. But I think we were among the first guys to start doing those, those stacked harmony things. It predates Andrew Gold, although Andrew took it to a, a real, elevated it to a real brilliant science. Um... And so uh, those records were made out there in the studio by the pond where if we got bored, we'd go into the little town nearby and have lunch or we'd go out on a rowboat and float around the lake or something. And, and it was camaraderie. We'd work forever and ever, you know, just go to the studio and stay there. Um, but that's how those records came about. And uh, Kyle and I, Kyle went on to produce uh, Randy Travis. Uh, and, and so many other artists over the years, and to this day, I still regard him as one of my very truest and dearest friends. 
Very cool, man. You know what I what I thought was really impressive was when I looked through. I think it was All Music or you know one of those, uh, and I saw both uh, for B.J. Thomas, I think in England, Dan and John Ford Coley, that you had a working session player relationship with these guys for forty years. I mean, I saw you had some credits with them like five years ago. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Long relationships with artists and with producers is something that I was always proud of because accounts come and accounts go. But eventually, you know, you get to a point where your artists are no longer in vogue. But but I had 25 or 26 years with George Strait. Um, I, uh, I had working relationships with Danny and John and Danny more or less after he went to a solo act. BJ, um, it's those things are really rewarding. It's so nice that you go in and you just kind of pick up where you left off. That's unheard of, though. I mean, you don't see that a lot. Usually it's like, you know, from what I understand, again, I'm just an outsider, but it's like, you know, whatever the producer who's, and I'm sure the same producer wasn't producing the record 40 years later, which means the artist had to say, these are my guys here. I think there's some of that. Yeah, there's some of that. And, and some of it is a smart producer will look at a relationship and say, eh, you know, if they're doing their homework and they're not engaged in today going forward, a good producer will take a look and say, wait a minute, I want to know, I want to swim a little deeper here and see what led up to today. You know, where has this been before? Number one, so I can understand the artist and the music. But number two, I don't want to repeat anything or reinvent anything, but I want to be able to draw from what they do, how they did it, and make it better. Mm. So some of it might have been a matter of somebody saying, well, that was a pretty good string of hits here, and who was on those records? Because I'm certainly not the only guy that's had that happen. Um, there's a lot of guys who have had, I'll, I'll cite you, Eddie Bayers, who's a drummer, again, another longtime friend. Um, he's had artist accounts uh, for years. Uh, and the Randy Travis deal I feel like about Randy the way and George and so many of these people that it's more than just going in and knocking out three hours of session time and going home. Mm. Vince, same way. You know, um, Vince and I were friends before Vince was Vince. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that, you know, that's not Vince playing the electric guitar parts on a couple of his big hit records. It's me. But I don't go around. I mean, that's probably the first time I've said that in a public interview. Because it's not for me to say. Yeah. Right? I did my work, I got my paycheck, and it was a hit, and that's great, and I'm gratified. But um, it's just what you do. And um, you don't go around trying to snipe somebody else's credit out from under them or undermine. And I think people pay attention to that. And it's like, this is a guy who's just, does good work, shows up on the planet. You know what? What you said is very true because I've interviewed probably a hundred well, – God, it's got to be 50 to 75 session guys in Nashville. And nobody, I mean, there's literally no, I mean, I'm sure it's there, but at least I have seen no ego at all. And I've been very fortunate to interview a lot of long term session players, and everybody's just very matter of fact about it. Anybody here that wants to play the ego card, is going to get um, they're going to find a bus ticket in their guitar case someday. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, honestly, I just haven't seen it. It was funny because somebody um, <laughs> from another part of the country, I don't want to say where, uh, said to me, "How do you deal with all those egos?" And I said, "I'll be." I said, "I don't really." I was kind of like. Put, not put off, but I, I didn't really understand the question. I said, you know, honestly, I would have a beer with 95% of the people I've spoken to, and I'd probably go out to dinner with my wife with 85 to 90%. So I don't – there is none of that there, man, really. Nashville, I, I give a lot of credit to this, to the early pioneers of our business in Nashville. Uh, Owen Bradley, Harold Bradley, uh, Chad Atkins – uh, not, and, and Chet had every right to be arrogant um, if he had chosen to be. He was a, he was a bona fide star. Yeah. 
Chet was a kind guy. I treasured every minute I spent with him, and I, I regret that I didn't spend more. But the template started early on that, you know, nobody is so good that they can't be replaced. And I think that a lot of the early guys who were so overloaded with gift and talent, the Grady Martins, the, uh, the Hank Garlands, I speak from guitar player experience, it never occurred to them to have an ego. They're just doing their job. Mm. A lot of guys on in other geographic areas, um, you know, like, um, let me say this. In Nashville, we, most of us, there's a couple of guys maybe now as the evolution changes, but we didn't have managers. Mm. We didn't have business agents. We didn't have PR people. We didn't pursue solo careers largely. Uh, some guys did. Some were successful. Some weren't. The deal was this. If you come in and you've got a great big attitude about how important your part is, you're just not going to get called back. Yeah. Because the spirit of making records has got to be a collaborative spirit. If you get one guy who's, who's going to go commando, and I've known a couple here. And they're no longer in town. They don't live here anymore. And they're out of the business. Mm. And your talent will not, will not carry you through that. Your talent will not get you through that. Because there's so many great guitar players and piano players and drummers. It's more about the psychology of understanding. You just can't be that guy. Yeah. You, you, you've got to... You're going to make people mad. You're going to alienate something because let me continue down this thread one second. I think that the, the core essential of being successful as a studio musician, maybe anywhere in life when you think about it, is psychology. When we would walk into a room, or at least I'll speak, I'll speak for myself. Hmm. When I walked into a studio one of the first things that my, God love them, my mentors taught me was you got to size up the room and figure out who wants to need, who's going to get what out of this experience. Because everybody in this room needs to get something out of this. Okay? Mm. So your job is to read the room, figure out who needs to kind of get something out of this. And then your job is to give them what they think they want. Right. Meanwhile, flying above it or below it or however you want to characterize it, making it good, making it quality so then you walk out of the room, you know, I did my job. You know, I didn't pander to anybody's special interests, but you learn how to smile when necessary, how to slap on the back when necessary. You learn how to shut up and be quiet when necessary. You learn how the, the, the rhythm of when a suggestion is good to make and when it might be really good if I just kind of keep the mouth shut for another pass or two and then I'll throw my suggestion out there or maybe I won't throw it out there at all yeah it's a psychological game as much as it is anything else I've heard this from a, from several other guys as far as you know you got to go in there and also see uh, like who's the you know who are, who's the perceived chief and who's the, who are the Indians and you know and understand and respect and work within the parameters of whatever that pecking order is you know and do the best job you can within that pecking order and sometimes that means making a suggestion and other times it means shutting up and I have heard that it is and when you're doing this on a rolling basis you got to learn you early on you got to try to hopefully I mean we all have to learn this lessons the hard way me included but you got to learn what ditch you're willing to die in. Yeah. Right? How deep a stand do I want to make over something that isn't really going to make this a hit record or not a hit record? You know, you're just not that smart and you're just not that important. You're part of a bigger piece that begins with a song and a singer's interpretation and delivery of that song and the music that surrounds that song and then it's out of your hands anyway, and, you know, you can't control what the record company's going to do or the promotion people are going to do or what the public is going to do. That thing you – there's two things you said. First of all, that uh, you got to learn which ditch you're, gonna, you're willing to die in. I love that. That's good stuff. Um, but what you just said now about is it going to matter, that's the, one of those things that you don't – I, I – speak for me i didn't learn that to later on that was a tough co to think about you know is it worth taking is this worth taking a stand for you know 
And I think that takes maturity. When I did not have that maturity when I was young, I just took a stand for because I felt a certain way. And then I started thinking as I got older, fortunately, finally, somehow the the dime dropped. And I was like, yeah, you know, what's so important? <laughs> you know, and that's a t- that, that's a tough one. At least it was for me. Good at what you do, and you gain the respect and the trust of those around you. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. Yeah. You know, it just rolls on. Let me give you an example. I want to speak glowingly of, of my dear pal Reggie because we sat next to each other. I mean, Reggie and I were pretty much the go-to guys for a long, long time in this town, which isn't to diminish anyone else's value or contribution. There were a lot of great guys, but Reg and I got most of the big calls and we carried the big accounts. Reggie didn't have to make a big deal out of the drift away intro. Right. He didn't have to try to, to dig in and fight for it or justify it because it was great. It was brilliant. It was just, again, it may, in my opinion, I think it comes back to that deal. He knowing Reg as I do, he sat there and noodled on something until this came up and somebody said, hey, that's pretty cool. Boom. Now, that made a difference in that record. Oh, hell yeah. Every every rule, every comment I make, there will be an exception. That record may not have been the same record without that. And that was one no of doubt. Reggie's that is one of Reggie's most admirable traits and, and and core strengths is his ability to come up with that thing, you know. Um and we all aspire to that, you know. Somebody else got to make the call if I contributed enough to some records that really made a difference to them. Um, the piano intro on Behind Closed Doors. Would that have been the same hit record without Pig Robbins playing that piano figure on there? You know, I don't know. It, those are the great unknowns that it's really easy to look at it in hindsight and say, yeah, I think that probably made a difference. But in the moment, you're just sitting there making a record and you're throwing your best fastball. Like I said, you've got to come with your game. Mm. If you throw your game at it and it winds up being an amazing thing, then great. But you know what? At the end of the day, you're going to get say, paid the same scale or double scale uh, for the next guy's session. So you got to try just as hard on the next session. Did you do that with Reggie when you guys were getting so much work and it was like, like you had no life? Did you go double scale with him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were all double scale. That's Larry, cool. London, Larry, and Reggie, and me, and uh, all of us went double. Uh, I think Larry London was the first guy to to go there, and that was driven by Joe Osborne. When Joe moved to town from Los Angeles, um, Joe talked about his his days of the wrecking crew, and the geography of Los Angeles made it impossible. You just couldn't get all over the place like you could in Nashville. Physically, you couldn't make it work. So he and Hal, uh, as the story went, came up with the idea of saying, look, I'm tired, I'm worn out, I'm burning out, I'm going to say, look, I'm going to charge twice as much, and if I lose half my work, I'm still leaving. Still making even, yeah, absolutely. Well, it turned out that the minute they went double scale, their work went up. <laughs> and, and the same thing, in some respects, happened here. Uh, there were years when, and I'm not the only one, but there weren't many, but there were some of us who doing 600 plus dates a year. That's crazy, man. It was crazy. And the thing was, is we went double scale. It didn't slow down. It's the old, I guess, the pricing psychology. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, you, tr- the, you know, why do you, why does someone like shopping at, you know, some stores on Fifth Avenue when you can get the same thing someplace else for half yeah. the price? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so that's, this, all this stuff gets complicated. And as I said, I will wander on you. But, but the thing is, is it's all connected. And you look at it and you go, well, I'm double scale because... Uh, I've got a pretty good bag full of credits now. I've got a big bag full of hits. And whether I contributed in some way to whether that was a hit or not a hit, your call. Yeah. But I can justify saying I believe that my participation in my experience justifies me being paid more than someone else. Um, and uh, and for those of us who all went double scale in the 70s, we, we didn't look back until the industry would not support it anymore. You know, but in in no, my but, mind, the key to that isn't just saying we feel that we're worth it. The key to that is saying, and if you don't feel we're worth it, that's totally cool. It was, yeah. Like we don't. It's good. We're not. You know, we don't need your work. And it's that. You know, because I'm, I'm always as a marketing guy. I'm always. It's the scarcity takeaway sort of thing. Like, hey, you know, you, you know, 
if you don't, you know what you what you can't have sometimes is more alluring, you know, or what's harder to obtain. Yeah. The human psychology, like I said, this you get it. You're a marketing guy. The psychology of this whole thing is is so hugely important. Yeah. It's not how many notes you can play or how 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 many great intros you make up or how many wild solos you play or whether you tell good funny jokes. It's about figuring out what everybody in the process needs to get out of the process. Tommy Tedesco probably pioneered that concept in L.A. It's, you, know? you guys are in the service business, man. and It's a service job. I've always said that. You know? If you know the way that I change your oil and I'm polite to you, you're going to come back and let me change the oil again. It's Basically. A job. Yeah. It's a service <laughs> business. Yeah. Totally. Um, let me ask you this. You've been involved in so many different things. I was wondering if it can even put this in context. What would be the top three experiences you've had musically? Um, in other words, maybe which one left you feeling either most satisfied or it was something about it that had a special nostalgia or sentimental meaning to you. And I know three and 42,000 is asking a lot. So just go by knee jerk reaction, you know, knowing yeah. that tomorrow it could be three different ones if I ask you the same question. Yeah. I mean, I'm always going to have. A soft spot, a, a warm place in my heart for the original Lynn Anderson experience because it came early and and it meant so much to me. But I'm, I'm going to name more than three because I don't think I can reduce it to three. All righty. And they're all mostly about relationships. Um, Dan Seals, England Dan, hmm. anything with Kyle Lang, Randy Travis, uh, I'd go to the end of the world for those two guys. George Strait, they were all rewarding. They were all great. It was all something that you said, I am so proud to be a part of this. Just a small part, but I'm in there. Um, in terms of events, you know, being the music director of the Opry is hugely important to me. Uh, being nominated for a primetime Emmy Award for the, for the uh, White House show. You know, we beat out, uh, not... I hope nobody will take offense to this, but the Paul McCartney show didn't get nominated. The Motown show didn't get nominated. Our little show got nominated. And to get a shout out from James Taylor um, in the context of that and to be nominated for the Big Boys Emmy. This, this isn't a regional Emmy. This is the big deal. Sure. When you get to that level, you're, you know, you're battling Kennedy Center honors and, and lots of stuff that you know is probably going to win the award. But just to get to the final five is a big deal. That's important. Um, um, gosh, there have been so many milestones working with George Harrison that, that can, that can never happen again. Yeah. Uh, working with seeing everything from, you know, Buck Owens to working with jazz crusaders to working with, uh, uh I, I don't know, I could go on and on working with certain producers. It's hard to really narrow it down to just a handful and that's a that's really a, a musical first world problem. Yeah, it really is, man. Uh, and uh, knee jerk reaction, best guitarist you've worked with. Best guitarist. <clears throat> well, that's not an easy one either, Craig. Uh, no, if I don't ask any easy questions, <laughs> there are several that come to mind. I got to give them all a shout. Yeah, uh, Grady Martin. Uh, of course, Reggie. Mutual admiration society there, I hope. Yes. Uh, because we were colleagues and, and there together. Brent Mason is a brilliant guitar player. Uh, I never got to work with Hank Garland, but I think Hank Garland was probably the first total guitar player as a studio musician in Nashville. Uh, I sincerely hope that he will be recognized and put into the Hall of Fame at some point. Um, his career was far too short, but he moved with great ease from jazz to hillbilly hard country, to contemporary for his generation, rock and roll. Brent Mason has that gift, um, and um, it's just a different world. Brent's a fine guitar player. There's so many, so many guys that are so, just so dadgum good. Dean Parks, Dean's not a Nashvilleian, but I have such regard for Dean. In our careers, Dean's been doing it a little longer, but we've kind of ran parallel to each other over the years. Uh, He's Hugh, an L.A. guy, right? Yeah, yeah, Dean's in L.A. Hugh McCracken in New York. Hugh was the, the consummate inside guitar player. There, 
in the studio business, there's like guys who play on the inside and guys who are outside. They're, it, this is hard to explain, but there are people who play inside the rhythm section and then there are the guys who are playing outside and contributing and, and lifting things into the rhythm section. And uh, <clears throat> Hugh was one of those examples. If you go back and listen to the Steely Dan records and things that he played on, and the same with Dean, parts are not necessarily flashy or complex, but if you took them out, this would not be the same record. Yeah. You know? Okay, you're the music director of the Grand Old Opry, and you've been in this slot for, I think, 16 years. And it was, you were, they made the slot for you. So I was curious what your primary responsibility is in this position. And what are you most proud of the work that you've done in this capacity? If you could even say, because I'm sure you've done a ton of stuff knowing your work ethic. I went to the Opry um, at the request of the general manager, Pete Fisher, who I had known. He'd worked for Warner Brothers and then he moved out there as GM. I went there with a stated objective that the Opry needed to to be reinvigorated musically and and it needed some freshening it needed some attitude adjustment um, and so the job was created for two reasons one actually several reasons one of the objectives was to improve the music and the attitude of the music to be more compatible with the interests of younger artists, um, it needed to move on. It needed freshening. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the second objective was to improve the quality of the on-air audio. And we were getting, at that time, we were doing a... Uh, uh, one hour weekly live live television show on CMT, Randall Opry Live, and the broadcast audio uh, was not up to standards. And so, in order, all, all of this stuff was to try to bring uh, a higher degree of credibility to the Opry for the music community in general to look at it and say, well, hey, we want to be a part of this going forward. And then, third, because it's a, a, a passion of mine, was to try to reassemble. Everything I could lay my hands on that was archival uh, recording of historically of either WSM radio or the Grand Ole Opry and then migrate that into uh, a sustainable digital format for posterity. Um, That's a that last one's a pretty big myth, like uh, digging out the uh, archives of, you know, some secret scrolls or something. That's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And we found we found uh, bits and pieces of things in the strangest of spots, you know, tops of closets, under the stairwell, down the basement. No one at the Opry ever contemplated the importance of the Opry as an ongoing cultural event. <clears throat> this thing existed. If you go back and read about the Opry, you will find that it's always been an event to sell something else. Um, there's a wonderful book. I will throw a plug in here because it's such a great book. It's called Air Castle of the South by Craig Havighurst. And it is a fantastic description of how WSM Radio and the Grand Ole Opry came to be. And uh, when I read that book, I, I was so proud to be a part of that organization. It was such an innovator um, for so long. But the deal here was is that nobody paid much attention to it, and they're a business. They're making money. We were looking for ways to capture these moments, uh, monetize them, preserve them. And um, so I went in, and um, it took a little while, you know, to get a feel for the culture. Uh, it is very much a, a culture in and of itself. One of the sweetest things about the whole experience was having the opportunity Fortunately, I got in in time to know Porter Wagoner and Jimmy Dickens and so many other iconic, legendary country music artists that really went back to the very kind of beginning of commercial country music. Jimmy Dickens knew Hank Williams. He's rabbled with Hank Williams. You know, you can Ray Price, same deal. Even and that's like playing on Ray Price's last couple of albums. Um, 
having those opportunities meant a lot to me because of my childhood and how I came to be who I am. Mm. But I had that opportunity, which was fantastic. The downside was is that there were a lot of entrenched opinions about how things ought to work, and um, we had to shake them up a little bit. Mm. So I enlisted the help of some of my music row buddies and said, come with me. This is a new journey. So let's try this. It's going to be fun. And we're going to pay attention to everyone who steps on that stage and treat everybody with equality because I don't know who the next, next whatever, Garth Brooks or Tim McGraw or, or Taylor Swift, I don't know who it is, and neither do you, and mm-hmm. neither do I. But we're going to treat everybody with respect and dignity, and we're going to hold the music up to the highest of standards as our way of showing that respect. So we did, and um, we made some difficult decisions about making some changes in personnel. Uh, that's never fun. And... Um, It had to happen, and we did it, and I brought my pals along, and to this day, I believe that that is, they are the country music way past even, the equivalent of a a Tonight Show band or a a Letterman band or anything, because those guys go in and, you know, they've got one or two songs and they play bumpers all night for the TV show. We play (laughs) any given night, you know, we'll play... 18 to 20 songs per night, wow. four nights a week, 52 weeks a year, including Christmas Day. If it's Christmas and it falls on a Friday or a Saturday, there's going to be a Grand Ole Opry. I spent four Christmases out there. That's what this is. It's the world's longest running performance. It's 93, I think, years old, 4,800 and some performances. There's no f- other place like this in the universe. It's all gone. We're the last, we're the last bastion, last holdout. And so the idea was to say, now, because we're going to go to this pain with the music, we're also going to go to great pains to make sure it translates as best as it can. And so we looked at audio. We just a fantastic team of audio people and tech people out there and uh, brought my friend George Massenberg along. Um, if you're familiar at all with any recording engineering technology, George Massenberg uh, is uh, brilliant. He invented uh, the flying faders. He also invented parametric EQ. He produced Linda Ronstadt. Um, he's brilliant. And George and I had a wonderful time being kids in a candy store. So now, to answer the question at hand is what do I do is I try to assure that there are some standards and practices where we get music in advance from artists. It gets distributed to the musicians. I make a production, basically a music producer kind of call about who out of the band needs to be playing on this spot with this artist. Um, <clears throat> we don't rehearse. We go live at 7 o'clock, and the only thing we get is maybe a couple of quick run-throughs on a selected artist or two prior to the show in the band cage. Wow. And uh, So you've got that, some, like, real ass-kicking pl- players there. To, yes, we do. Yeah. We sure do. These guys are, particularly for this kind of a gig, I'll put them up any day of the week. When, when Paul Schaefer comes to town and comes and hangs out with us and just stands there and shakes his head and he says, I don't know how you guys do this. How do you guys do this? That's pretty I'm impressive. Sure. And when this happens, uh, I will forever be proud of the achievement, not that I've made so much, but the achievement of the group of people and the dedication, they care about this stuff. And they're learning music on their own time, and they come in and they work their tails off. Um, so I do that. I interface a lot directly with artists. Um, of course, i got to put on my corporate hat, and I deal with the front office and the management. They have their – we're back to the psychology deal, Craig. Everybody gets something out of this experience. So if I deal with a manager or uh, an artist or um, – a, a, you know, a visiting guest musician, because we do have artists that bring their bands. Um, what does the tech department need to get out of this? How can I help them get what they need? Um, how do we make the experience better? Because it's essentially, even today, it's an old school plug and play vaudeville variety show. No rehearsal. You come out, you play, you stand there and you sing. So it's a journey. Each time I will get with an artist and I will say, what can we do for the monitor mix for you next time? Right? Well, how can we make this better? Because we can't possibly know everything in advance. So it's a rolling, 
learning curve uh, or a learning experience. So you're very hands on here. This isn't like a you know a management position where you've got you know a few guys in each department you know basically carrying out you know your uh, missions for them. You're like super hands on here. Kind of, but my management style is uh, often at odds with the traditional corporate style at the at the larger company. Uh, I am a big believer in the management style that you hire good people, you give them guidance, and then you stay out of their way, and they'll make you look smart. Hmm. Uh, that was that was uh, one of Chet's philosophies about making records: hire great musicians and leave them alone, and they'll cut a hit. Hmm. Uh, I. You have to empower people to use their best judgment with the full understanding that maybe they're going to screw up. Yeah. But, and that's the point where you got to step in and say, okay, I got to talk to you seriously about something. This mm-hmm. is something that happened and it can't happen again. I understand where you were going with it, but that wasn't a successful approach. So next time, let's try it this way. Yeah. But there's no yelling, there's no screaming, there's no threatening. I never saw much like the the ego question about studio musicians. Uh, there's no advantage in that in an opera environment because everybody's got to have each other's back. Yeah. If you're respectful and when there is an issue, you discuss it because everybody might have a different opinion. You can't always be right. You can't always have the absolute answer. And so I try to work in that context, which puts me in the context of balancing a lot of interests. Managers have very real interests. Publicists have interests. Uh, the marketing department of the Opry has interests. Um, the front office has interests. Yeah, that's got to be tough because not all those interests are always congruent. No, they're rarely. Yeah, they're rarely. right, like right. Thing. But I know, <laughs> back to this thing about, but I know if we take care of the music, and I know if my musicians, and, and me too, because I still get out and play, and I would love to do it. I know that if we know what we're doing when we step on the stage and we deliver that, then we have done our job. Mm-hmm. We've done what we are what we are responsible for doing, and ninety nine percent of the time it goes great. Every once in a while, you'll have an act that, you know, uh, especially younger acts. Sometimes they're they're nervous, they're scared. They have every right to be. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of I Opry is that it, uh, I got two sayings. One is that it's always the same, but it's never the same thing twice. Yeah. The other is it's kind of like the movie Groundhog Day, right? Yeah. You get to come back and do this again. Nobody dies. Nobody gets in trouble. No nothing. It's, yeah, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a rolling experience in, in joyous camaraderie. Well, <laughs> I can, it, it's really – in hearing all this, it was very a, a smart decision to make the musical director a musician because that's the – ultimately – that is what your product is. Thank you. Yeah, and because I'm sitting here thinking, oh my god, if they had some like manager dude in there that was like some corporate, you know, doofus for whatever, you know, that's what that's your product, man. It's really key. It is the product. Yeah. There is no brand on Opry. There is no brand, and there is no cornerstone without music. That's the foundation that was poured in 1925. It's what it is, and it's what I hope it will always be. Now, naturally, other things spring off of that as business initiatives, and that's only smart. They have yeah, to do of that. course. you got to make money. We fit in where we can. But you can't analyze – well, you can because it is happening in the world around us today, and I regret it. But it, I'm still a believer in the fact that research and analysis and metrics are important tools for everything – if you got to buy a lawnmower, you want to maybe check out what your neighbor thinks of his, or you go online and read the reviews, or you, whatever. I'm, I'm being pretty loose in my uh, analysis there, my uh, uh, my uh, analogy person, yeah, but uh, yeah, analogy. Thank you. Um, so it's useful, but it's flawed because inherently, if you're going to do music, it's like art, it's like any other of the arts. Yeah. Do you see? What do you hear in this? What does it strike? And so long as it always strikes something within the heart and the mind of the viewer, the listener, um, then you can't always get it right with research. Yeah. No, but if you didn't have a, a music, if you didn't have one of them 
in that position, this whole thing would fall apart because there's no way a guy or a gal that's not a musician, an active working musician, or has been an active for a, a, an extensive period, that person, there's no way of knowing all the uh you know the 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 hundreds of moving parts that are involved in this and if those parts are neglected like i said the whole thing doesn't go so that was actually a pretty smart decision that they put you know someone out of one of them in in the uh i credit my friend pete fisher with that and pete has now left the company he's now the ceo of the academy of country music in los angeles and uh uh pete saw that need he saw that this you can be musical, I guess, and still be a, a corporate officer, but those guys are worried about um, how to sell tickets, how to build value. They've got shareholders to report to. They have uh, they have to worry about how many uh, hot dogs do we order for this weekend because we've got a double show. They've got things that they do that are that are that grow from the brand being music. That's the core. But I've never expected them to understand the nuance that you get into. I'm not sure I have, I don't know, I don't have all the answers and I'm not sure that I understand all the questions. Yeah. But what, the, what they don't understand, that's going to, that would crush your business. Yeah. They, yeah. you can be a theoretical, say, well, this is what we're going to do. This mm. makes great sense on paper and in a boardroom. And this is what we're going to do. Problem is, it's like so many other things in life. It won't work. Yeah. That's why architects draw and engineers engineer. Yeah. Okay, true. I've got this concept for uh, this wild shaped building. Well, it's beautiful as art, but I gotta have an engineer tell me if it's gonna stand or if it's gonna fall over. Hmm. For There's sure. my analogy, and, I, yeah. and maybe it's being too lofty. Maybe I'm ascribing way too much importance to this, but no, no, I try it, to think it's, about this stuff because they think it matters. No, I think I think it's directly. It makes a ton of sense. What's been your biggest challenges in this position? Not who, what. <laughs> Um, the biggest challenge is that as music trends change, they, they, they are getting to where they change a lot more quickly. Um, helping others understand that it's often difficult, if not impossible to react quickly to those changes. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a, for instance, I once was in a conversation with a radio programmer who was busting my chops over a record I produced because he said, man, you guys are just you're way behind. I don't understand why you can't give us this and this and this and do it like, like next week. And he said, I go out and I do my alcohol research at the mall and I can change my playlist every week. And I said, I understand that. You have that because you're following what comes out. Now, if there's a new trend that happens, there's a process. First of all, somebody's got to write the song. You got to go in the studio. You, you got the, the the bureaucracy of the record company, the budgeting, the process, the mixing, the manufacturing, the slotting it for a release, the promotion. I can't get there that fast in the system that works. Now, once upon a time, there's a, a wonderful story about a Roy Orbison record that was recorded at 6 p.m. here, and uh, uh, the the parts were flown overnight up to Terre Haute, Indiana, to the CBS pressing plant, and the next morning it was on the radio. Wow. You know, now that was back when everybody was running and gunning in their own way, and and it was a much simpler world. So, to some extent, one might argue, well, you could do the same thing right now with any kind of webcasting derivative, um, and it's true. But the the legs that support that are not as easy as they were. There's more complexity to it, I guess. But yeah. <clears throat> um, anyhow, it's trying to help people understand the change doesn't happen overnight. Uh, building consensus to accept that change can be a challenge. Uh, that's, again, you're back to psychology. Yeah. People people have their thing that they... People don't always see eye to eye, and the, the goal is to lead them to this consensus, not demand that they come along. You just don't beat the horse and make him come to the water. You want to say, hey, that's pretty clean, cool water over here. Why don't you walk over here with me? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's my style of trying to be a leader is to say, let's try this. If it doesn't work, we can always back up. Okay, but if I go running as hard as I can and I hit the wall, I don't have any choice but to back up. Yeah, right, right. So, I does that answer your question? Yeah, it's very, very well. Thank you. You mentioned a few times you grew up in Peoria. Uh, 
what, what kind of childhood did you have in you know, like family life, brothers and sisters? What kind of work did mom and dad do? Yeah, the lightning round thing here, I, I like that. I was looking at it thinking maybe we'll get the uh, – the, uh, Let me tell you, when I asked that question, you had a big old smile up on your face. So that's good, man. That's good. I, uh, my mother and father were as – as I said, I was the one who, who uh, got the musical gene. Hmm. My uh, maternal grandfather was an interesting fella. He was – he had a Wild West show back at the – early part of the 20th century. Still got some photographs of it. So he was the link to showbiz. Uh, but my mother and father and my brothers, as I said, I grew up in a household without necessarily advanced musicianship, but with a deep passion and a love for the music. Um, they recognized early on, probably when I was five or six years old, that every time I walked through the yard, I'd pick up a stick and try to play it like a guitar. And this is true stuff. My mother always, before she passed, she said, I'm, I regret more than anything in the world that, that I would make you lay that stick down before I take a picture of it. And she said, I wish I had one. And I do too. But they supported me. At the time when I started to get interested in the guitar, they had friends who had little hillbilly bands, you know, and I mean little three-piece hobby bands. But they would take me to their houses. And so I grew up around older people learning how to do this thing. And then when it came time for me to get out and really get an opportunity to perform, um, they took me. And Peoria was a, a river city, a manufacturing city, a whiskey city, a steel city. And there was a ton of music there because uh, Caterpillar Tractor was headquartered there. And a lot of Southern people moved up there before the war uh, for employment. That's how my dad wound up there from Kentucky. There were tons of bars. And there were VFWs. And there were things like that, that in the South, you might have the church influence on music. But in the Midwest, it was different. Mm. So the place to learn and develop those skills was by playing those places. The VFWs, you might luck up and get a Sunday afternoon gig, but most of them were nine to one. Mm. My mom and dad never missed a night, ever that one or the other, and mainly both, were not present and accounted for in any gin joint that I played in. And my dad was a truck driver. He worked hard. Um, I don't ever remember him not having two jobs until he finally retired. But my mom was a homemaker. And uh, they could not, I could not have ever wished for more supportive parents who were not pushy showbiz parents. Mm. They recognized my passion. They supported it and encouraged it. And the same with my brothers. My brothers, I was the little brother. There was 10 years difference between me and my next older brother. And uh, I think they were proud of me. I think they wanted me to succeed. More than anything else now, I realize what they gave to me um, was my freedom at 19. They believed enough in me and they believed enough in what I might achieve to let me go. Mm. And they knew I wasn't coming back. You know? Yeah, that that probably took a lot, especially back back in that day. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of. Uh, that was really cool. It was incredibly cool. Mm. They supported me with quality instruments. You know, I know how hard they worked, but they didn't go buy a cheap guitar. They bought a Gibson. You know, the, the, that SG was, was an expensive guitar in 1964. And you still have that. Yeah. 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 I do. I've still got that. I've still got my uh, Ampeg. Uh, what was it? It was the uh, Portaflex guitar amp. That was the BXT or something. That was an old Portaflex amp with the. <clears throat> it was big. It was expensive back then. But I had quality instruments. I had opportunities. They tried to give me formal lessons. That didn't work because my ears were faster than my eyes. Sure. I just could not. I was impatient. My ear caught it so quickly that I could not discipline myself to read the note, understand the note, translate the note. I could listen to it and play it. Yeah. And so that skill was both a blessing and a curse. No, that's a good problem to have. It, it, it's serving <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a good problem. I think the have. biggest thing that I, I appreciate about it all, though, is the opportunity to have grown up as a free range kid. You know? Very cool, man. Neighborhood kids. Everybody's mom watched out. We were, 
we were not farmers, but we were out in the country. And, uh, and to this day, I still count on some of those people. They're still friends. I stay in touch with friends from my childhood. You know, my success is not translated to big me, little you. It's tried to always be. It's not where we come from. Um, and, uh, but that tells you a little bit about how much I love mom and dad and my brothers. And unfortunately, I only have my one brother left now. But uh, uh, I am grateful and thankful for every single thing that they gave me. Is he in Peoria or is he down there in Nashville? He still lives up in Peoria. He comes down, hangs out a little bit, and uh, he'll come backstage to the Opry and hang. He's a, he's a sweetheart of a guy. I, I love him dearly. That's nice. Yeah. I'm glad you got him. Me too. We all, you know, as far as tuition, you know, everybody makes mistakes. And I was curious if you'd be willing to maybe share one or two mistakes that you might have made early on in your career and, the, you know, the tuition you paid and the lessons that you learned from those mistakes. Well, I don't think I ever did anything catastrophic or I probably wouldn't be here talking to you <laughs> now. But there were plenty of things that, that just, you know, I lay down at night and say, well, it's time to take a nice – I used to get a nice night's nice sleep, and my brain says, "Yeah, just a second. Let's go back and think about that experience in 1977. <laughs> you uh, put your foot in your mouth, and uh, we all have those, too. Yeah. Um, I think the one career move that I made a mistake in is that I tried to transition too quickly from being a guitar player to a record producer. Um, I don't think I was quite old enough to have the global experience and stability to do that and understand what game I was stepping into. Because when you move from being a creative into being a producer, you can be a producer, but it means you're going to start interacting with corporate executives, lawyers, artists, managers. And at 25, 26, I don't know, there's very few people who yeah. can be adequately life prepared for that. Mm. Um, I owe, once I saw that, I was able to step back, return to my role as a guitar player. Um, wow, they, you know, just to interrupt you for a second, that is a lot of credit to, to, to recognize that at that age and then to take action on it. I, honestly, man, I'm not blowing smoke, but that's pretty impressive. That you realize well, that you look at it and you think, uh, you know, I, I never dreamed anything could go wrong, but there's a real chance something might go wrong if I don't do something about this. Mm. And and that's when you find out who your friends are, for one thing, and that's who you find out who's still willing to say, hey, man, you're still I want you on my sessions. And yeah. that's where friends like Kyle Lenning uh, were there. Kyle and I were competing producers. Norbert and I were not really competing because we never really did have a. A competition thing going on but another guy who was extremely good to me and uh, another one I keep calling them all dear friends but they are is Jim Ed Norman Jim Ed ran Warner Brothers Records here for a long time he was uh, an early member of a band called Shiloh that went on to become the Eagles hmm. uh, he wrote the string arrangement on uh, Desperado and, uh, and he transitioned from a creative role into being the uh, president of Warner Brothers Records here for 20 something years and uh, it turns out, you know, it's like Reggie was working the Jimmy Bowen account. I had all the Warner Brothers account and most of the MCA, depending on the times. But you know, we had the biggest accounts in town. Mostly uh, that was when I came back to it, which in turn, the experience led me to a new opportunity to become a record producer again. Um, so it, it, it came it, back around to you. Yeah, it all came back around. I just... You know, when you have the kind of successes that I had at such a young age, I'm I'm not infallible. Nobody is. Thought I handled it pretty well, and I I think that will stand the test of time. But you just don't have that global life experience. Yeah, cool. to do and, much. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, a lot of things came very early for me, and they came what seemed like pretty easily for me. So I retrenched, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, where can I improve myself as a person? And along the way, I hope I've done that. Um, and uh, I also realized that uh, you, you've got to you've got to be flexible. You know, nobody knows it all. Thank you. It, it, as, if you had a sorry, I'm stuttering here. If you had to go back and 
like give yourself advice, you know, the younger Steve advice, what advice would you have given yourself? And would it have been different advice, the advice you gave 35-year-old Steve than 45-year-old Steve? Um, talk less, listen more. Man, you don't come across as a guy who is talking and not listening, to be honest with you. You come across as a very well thought out observer of things. I don't think at any age you can ever go wrong by being a listener and not a talker. Yeah, this is true. You know, I think that that's the best advice is to. It all goes back to that whole philosophy I've got about you're going to learn more from observing and listening and being around people and, and, and treasure those people who came before you. Respect them, treasure your time with them because they will teach you something that you will glean uh, that will be applicable in your career. And someday it will sneak up on you and you'll go, I wonder what made you think of that. And you might tie it back to a memory of a conversation with somebody. Maybe it won't. But... I think that's good advice today, good advice then, good advice to anybody, anywhere, anytime. Um, never stop trying to learn. You know, I don't read notes, but I just ordered, um, uh, I've already I've already loaned the book out to my son, so I've forgotten the name of the arranger, but it's, it's a book on basic arranging templates. I don't want to stop learning. I've got things I want to start mapping out. Technology is going to make this a lot easier for me as a non-reader. Uh, but um, I can hear it all in my head. Now what I want to begin to understand at this point in my life is, how do I get it from here? It's the inverse of what I talked about earlier. Hmm. I want to get it now from my head, through my hands, and on the paper. Yeah. Let's switch and talk about gear for a little bit. And if you don't mind, if we could talk about electric, because I know nothing about acoustic, and I don't even want to <laughs> pretend. What what would be? I mean, you've probably got so many cool guitars. What's like your go to guitar now, and what other two might round out your top three? Well, forever, my old Stratocaster. I've got old Stratocasters. The the one that I used on the Dan and John records. I played that guitar forever and ever, and it will it will always be my Buddy Holly guitar. Uh, Buddy Holly probably had. We didn't talk about this, but I'll throw it out there. Buddy Holly pushed me over the edge on. At that age, where I was six years old, uh, Buddy Holly uh, invented, as far as I'm concerned, there, Buddy Holly invented the Stratocaster, and he invented the four-piece rock and roll band. And I would argue all day and all night to anybody who wanted to dispute that, because it's the truth as I see it, and as I knew the people who surrounded Buddy Holly. And... Uh, Buddy Holly's death impacted me. His music impacted me. His death impacted me so much that I stood in front of my first grade, grade school class to announce to everyone and read the story out of the newspaper. Wow. They all sat there, I'm sure, you know, picking their nose or something. <laughs> so the Stratocaster was, was my first, when I could first afford to buy a Strat in the Buddy Holly series of the several that he owned, I bought one. Bought it from George Gruen at Gruen Guitars, and I paid four hundred and seventy-five dollars for it. That's the fifty-five Strat you have. Is that a Sunburst? Yes. Four hundred and seventy-five dollars in nineteen fifty-five is a lot of bread, man. Well, holy! The, cr that's probably. I mean, I don't know, but if I had to throw a dart, that's probably like eight or nine thousand dollars today. Yeah, well, the guitar got places. up to you know that same guitar was forty, fifty thousand dollar guitar. Yeah, a good investment for sure. For it's sure. a market, right? It, yeah. That's that's not the point. I'll never let it go. Yeah, uh, I expect that uh, if I go, that guitar will go with me. That's uh, my Desert Island guitar. Awesome. Um, other electrics that I love, I've got uh, a three thirty five. Uh, I have a bunch of 335s. My favorite is the uh, uh, I've got a 59 that is a very fine guitar. Uh, but I've got a, a set of the series of 62s, a 35, 45, and a 55. Wow. They're all PAF pickups, and they sound great. Holy smokes, man. That's uh, a treat. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I wish I could get them all out, and I try to get them all out. Telecasters, I, you know, I never – I've played Telecasters most of my life. My favorite Telecaster – is a Frankenstein that I've got that's got 58 pickups in it. Um, and um, it's got a, 
actually it has a 58 pickup in the back. It's got a probably a mid 70s Stratocaster pickup in the front. Um, and it has a, a, a big speed B bender on it, hmm. uh, which is actually called a palm pedal. Big Speed made them for a, just a, you know, a minute back in the early seventies. I got it from a guitar player named Paul Yandel, who was uh, Chet Atkins right hand guy and Jerry Reed's right hand guy. And Paul got it from Chester. So I can trace the lineage directly back to Chet. Uh, and I played that B bender on that Telecaster on, I won't go into them at the moment, but someday when we're sitting around, I'll tell you probably a couple of dozen of number one records right there. That guitar was my go-to, is my go-to Telecaster. I had a Frankenstein, another one that I had that I used in the studio a lot, which was a fine guitar. Um, but uh, it was just different. You know, the B-Bender guitar is, is good for certain things, and it's hard not to use that feature when you're playing that guitar, especially with the palm pedal. If you ever look those up, you'll see, because it's, it's actually got levers sticking out um, on the top of the guitar. But anyway... Those are great. Um, I still um, I have a Paul Reed Smith that is a uh, gosh Paul will kill me if I don't remember the year, but I want to say it's an '86. It's an early one with a solid maple top. Uh, it's not book matched two piece. It's one of the one piece tops. Magnificent guitar. Um, it's a, a Strat style. Well, it's the PRS. It's yeah. the the early original PRS style. Um, and that's a wonderful guitar that does wonderful things. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. You know, you get past everybody ought to have in their case. They, I don't have a Les Paul that I love. I would love the SG. Um, everybody has to have a Strat. You have to have a Tele. You have to have a 335, and you have to have a Les Paul or equivalent. And mm. that Les Paul equivalent for me is the PRS. Man, those are some awesome guitars. That's what made you get the three thirty five, three forty five, and the three fifty five. Was that like a, a like a good with celebration? It sounds like almost like, hey man, I got a bunch of dough and I'm gonna like. I'm on a mission. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna. This is like my well, present I picked them to myself. Over a time period, they just happen to be. They all. It, it really I lucked into it. Um, Vince, we haven't done it in a long time, but occasionally Vince and I would show up down at Grun. Uh, George's shop at the same time and Vince can't pass by a guitar without buying it. Uh, you, you've heard of his collection I'm sure Yeah, um, and, and it's staggering but it would be like you know he'd say you can buy it and I'd say well I don't know he says well if you're not I'm going to I'd go on well, maybe I better buy this uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe for a few, you know he got he got some uh, and uh, and so it, it was never by design. I just have the advantage of longevity where I've found instruments over the years where I've been able to pick them up at a good price or some story behind them. Um, and uh, so I've, I've just built a collection over the years. When you play those, I'm sorry to keep talking about those guitars. I love 335. Okay. Um, is there a, like a distinct audible difference in the 35, 45, and the 55. Yes, there is. Uh, these are 100% original guitars, so they still have the veritone switch in the circuit. Oh, I love that. Yeah, but it does make a difference in the sound, and people either like it or they don't like it. Um, a lot of guys just uh, cut that circuit out um, and uh, you know d disabled it because they didn't like the, the capacitor tone effect. Um, the 355 is a different sounding guitar because it's an ebony neck and it's a much heavier guitar and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of my equivalent to about a 58 DeSoto. You know what I mean? It's got a lot of chrome and yeah. uh, it's pretty flashy. But my is that the hottest guitar of the three? I think you know, I've never sat down and really like measured output and everything like that. But uh, my favorite of the three is the 335, and it's actually the 62 is probably my favorite. The 59 is a great guitar, too. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's wonderful. But the the 335 is a stop tail, factory stop tail, um, and it, it's just a great guitar. And, yes, there's a big, big difference, at least that I hear, between the PAFs and the mid-60s switch over to the humbucking 
pick up a better. Mm. So, what? Uh, I'm sure you got tons of cool stories with these. Can you? Is there one story that you could share that's like the coolest guitar story of how you acquired the guitar? Oh boy, I'd really have to think about that. Um, uh, I didn't like win anything in a poker game. I don't have any really <laughs> good couple <color> stories. <laughs> I'll tell you a good story. I saved a Gretsch anniversary model. Uh, and it's an interesting story because those were not pretty guitars. They were two-tone green, you know, pea green color. And as a as a tip of the hat to Porter Wagoner's song, Green Green Grass at Home, I always refer to this as the green green Gretsch from home when I would take it into the studio. But this guitar came to my attention from a piano player who walked into the studio and he says, hey, there's a guitar out in the dumpster out there. I said, really? And he said, uh, yeah, it's in like a grayish case. And he was a country guy. And, and so I didn't understand grayish. I thought he meant with his accent, Gretsch, grayish. Oh. And we went out and we fished it out. And sure enough, here's this lonely little anniversary model and the neck had come off of it. And I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this home and baby it up. So I took it to my friend Joe Glazer here. who's the I, I know Joe. Yeah. Joe, yeah, what, what, what can I say? Um, and he, he remounted the neck and I put a Bixby on it. And it's still got one orphan oddball tuning key on it and it's missing a knob. And I love the guitar. I love the way it sounds. I love the way it plays. And mostly I love because I felt like I saved it from a, a dismal ending. That's like, a, and, that's like uh, getting a kitty at the shelter, man. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was. I having saved that one from the crusher. Yeah, man. Uh, and others, you know, I, I've got uh, I've got a couple of acoustic guitars that have stories. One of which I got from through Chat. I didn't buy it from Chat, but there were four of them in town. It was a Hernandez uh, who made mostly classical guitars, and they built some dreadnoughts. Four came to town. Chester kept one, Johnny Christopher got one, Bobby Thompson got one, and I got one. To the best of my knowledge, I may have the only one left here. And that was a go-to acoustic guitar for ages, ages. Mm-hmm. You know? Very cool. Thank you. Uh, Music-wise, actually, I'm going to ask you one more question about guitar. You still are clearly really enjoy playing i mean you know you hold like when i just asked you about guitars your whole body language is like really energetic and you're kind of glowing what what is this enthusiasm like what do you get emotionally out of picking up the guitar and playing it it's an extension of myself i think a lot of guitar players will tell you that if they think it's part of your body your body conforms to the guitar. It's why we all hunch over and why we've all got bad backs and bad necks. <laughs> it becomes a part of your life and an extension of who you are, an extension of your hands and your arms and your, 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 your torso. Um, it brings me great comfort. I keep one around as close as I can uh, whenever I can. And sometimes I will sit in Something will just flash through my mind. I go to the guitar and I figure it out. And I think, okay, now I know how to do that. Okay, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And I'll put the guitar down and I'll walk away. Other times I might sit and play for an hour. Other times, you know, you walk in on a session or you walk into like the opera gig, you walk in, you pick up the guitar, you go play, and that's it. It's just that it's part of who we are. I think I can safely say that for just about every guitar player there is. Did anybody ever walk into you in your office in the opera and you're playing guitar and like oh. look at you like what the hell's going on? <laughs> you know, no, they, they encourage I used to tell all the young guys and, and a couple of the younger people, a couple of the young women, I said, Listen, if you got a guitar, bring it in one day and I'll get out my setup kit and we'll sit here and we'll set it up for you, you know, we'll adjust the bridge. <laughs> and uh, bring it in, let me look at it here. Let me show you this little thing here. Uh, I was always inspired by Chet Atkins about that because Chet always kept a guitar within an arm's length and Chester was always playing and he was quick to acknowledge that as an old saying that's been quoted that we say, you know, if, if you go a day without playing the guitar, you can tell it. If you go two days, your friends can tell it. But yeah. if you go three days, everybody can tell it. And uh, when Chet was so ill toward the end of his life, he still kept guitars around and he couldn't play them. But if any guitar player went in to visit with Chester, it would be, 
uh, pick up a guitar and play me a little wildwood flower or something. You know, play me a little something. Huh? What are you working on? You know? Yeah. And it was important for him and I don't know, maybe that rubbed off on me because I remember the stories and I'm telling them to you now, so it must have had some deep impact. Um, yeah, I'm sure piano players feel the same way about it, you know? I think there's a connection that happens and it's a uh, it's a connection that's very deep in the brain and it has to do with fractals and DNA and, you know, you could, you could, I could theorize and justify all day long. All I know is it makes me happy. Thank you. Desert Island Discs. If I had a, if I asked you to tell me your top three Desert Island Discs in no particular order, and God, that's so unfair. Knowing they could change tomorrow again, knee jerk reaction for now. That is. So I'm trying unfair. to make it easier. It's not. Uh, <laughs> Another, um, one question I forget. Can I pick box sets? <laughs> you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd probably pick some things that might surprise people. One Desert Island disc would be uh, a Harry Nelson record called A Little Touch of Schmilson in the Night. Great artist. It's it's a brilliant record by Nelson and a brilliant arranger named uh, uh, Gordon Jenkins. Um, anything, I think, by Buck Owens would be important to have. And there is one George Strait record... Um, I don't remember the album title, but the song on it was, uh, um, I believe it was out of out of the clear out of the blue clear sky. It's a and title. I remember when we recorded that album, we we always did playback parties at the ends of the albums, and I remember standing in the back of the studio in a silence, and I said, "I think that might be the best collection of songs I've ever played on." Now then, you start digging deeper, and you go into genre, and you go into artistic stuff, and I would say, well, you know, how can I leave Loggins out of that, or Guy Clark, or Mickey Newberry, or how can I leave Lynn, or, or uh, you know, it's just really, really hard. That's why there might even be some other things that are outside of the country genre or the pop rock genre that I would go to as desert island stuff. Sometimes you just got to go there. When you said it might surprise you, I was hoping you were going to say like Metallica because that would have surprised me. <laughs> I would have been like, "Wow, that is a surprise." <laughs> no, how about Ario Speedwagon? Ario Speed. You know, it's this is a uh, really funny. Um, I'm not a guy that's starstruck one little bit because I know that everybody's got the same bullshit to deal with in their life. Their kids don't listen to them enough. They got too much stuff to do. They got too many bills to pay, not enough time to relax. You know, so I, I just figure everybody's the same, just do different stuff. But I get a phone call the day. You mentioned Ario Speedwagon. And I pick up the phone and I say, hey, hello. It says, hey, Craig, it's Dave Amato from Ario Speedwagon. And it's just funny when I, like, uh, people that I grew up listening to and they call, it's just, it's a. It takes a second to process. It's just a weird thing for me. I, I, I just. I've already thought. I've just. I want to add two more records to the desert. Yes, album. do it, man. Stylistics greatest hits. There you go. And Al Green's greatest hits. Great album. Okay. There you go. That's how fast this can turn. And on that, I, I was only being partially flippant when I said Ario Speedwagon because they caught a lot of flack, as did. Journey and a lot of other people for for in their day. I go back and I listen to those records now with a, a different set of headphones on, and I recognize that was pretty damn good music. Yeah, hey, it's, it's just still like, around. Yeah, you know, and just like the stuff, you know, you could go and say uh, BG stuff. They caught so much crap for being what they were, but when I listen to them now, I'm thinking, wait a minute. You know, Alba Galutin and, and uh, Barry Gibb and those guys, they knew something we didn't know. Yeah. Okay? You sure. just don't get lucky that often. No. Um, that, that yeah. man, I like that. You just, that is true. And I'll make that observation about, about a lot of producers that people, in particular, I'll, I can speak now about him because he's gone, and I speak with him with great reverence, is Rick Hall down in Muscle Shoals. Rick used to get, you know, Rick cut all kinds of amazing records. But he had that reputation of being one of those guys that would really beat people up hard. But I was working down there for Rick one time, and we were walking down the hallway, and I'm looking at 
Otis Redding and the Osmonds and Mac Davis and then, you know, all these R&B artists and everything. And I, I said, you know something? People can say what they want to say about Rick, but nobody gets this lucky this often. He knows something that we don't know. He may not be articulate in how he can say it or bring it to pass, but he knows something mm. that we don't understand. I like that. You just don't get lucky that often. No. What's something you've learned about yourself along this journey, Steve? Uh, that I'm far from perfect. That there are things that I wish I could play and wish I had studied that I didn't, and I regret that. Um, I have learned that I can have good days and bad days, and at the end of the day, I just kind of ask my forgivenesses and, and lay down and try to reach each day with some sense of wanting to learn something new or accomplish something meaningful. Um, I wish I had been more patient over the years. I wish sometimes that I had taken a lot of things more seriously than I did. I hope that I have learned how to be a kinder human being, and I hope that I can be a better mentor and a better teacher and a better philosopher in my own simple-minded way. I've learned, though, that I don't have all the answers. But I've also learned nobody else does either. Thanks, man. That was very genuine. What's your best childhood memory? Being happy. Just being, a, like I said, a free-range kid. Growing up in a good time where there was such a... I grew up in a loving family, supportive family, uh, good values, uh, fun times, um, and... Uh, and as far as musically, it was that wonderful opportunity to live in a world, like I said, when we'd hear Johnny Mathis next to Johnny Cash on the radio. I, I loved it all. I loved every bit of it. People could knock Pat Boone, but I loved it when Mom played Pat Boone records. Right? I mean, the guy was a great singer. He was so, a great singer. You know, he, he was a, a product of somebody, his, his record company, and Randy Wood, the guy that ran the company, said, I see a market. I can make money if I take Little Richard right? Tutti Frutti. And I go recording on Pat Boone. I'm not going to condemn him for that. You know, and the guy is just what it was. So I had great memories of, of a diverse musical childhood around people that were good, good values, good fun memories. Tell me something about yourself. People would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Well, I don't know how odd I am. That depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always feel like I need to ask the the spouse this question. It's like if you ask my wife, she'd probably be there for about an hour with a list, and I'd be like maybe one or two things, you know. Well, I, I tend to have kind of a, a wicked eccentric sense of humor, which my daughter has inherited, uh, which doesn't always go over really well. Sometimes what I think is kind of clever and funny goes right past the intended recipient. Um, that's, that, that's why you like the British – yeah, I, I mean, I enjoy anybody who has, I enjoy sharp minds. I, I endeavor to stay even with them, and I always learn something from them. <laughs> um, I, uh, I have, my hobbies are simple. I'm trying to get back to where I have hobbies, but I love, uh, I love, oddly enough, I, I've got a real affection for mechanical things like cars, love old cars, love tinkering with cars, don't know enough about them. I love trains. I love uh, everything about it. I love aircraft. I love, it occurred to me that I have a, a sort of a, a trend here line where I, I'm connected to things that go bang, bang, boom, boom, like little kids. Uh, I love photography. I love architecture. I love design. Um, I, uh, I hope that, uh, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, if I can't learn everything about music, although I'm trying I mean, I'm I'm going at it, man. I intend to get seriously woodshedding on learning the, the inside chords and the old standards and understanding and try to get in that mindset of the guitar players, the post-war jazz guitar players. They were incredible. And I, I, I 
could go on with a list, but there were so many of them and they were great. These were the guys that came back from the war having been exposed to different kinds of music in, in Europe and, and wherever they were. And American art and entertainment and design and culture, some of the greatest years were those years following World War II, some of Broadway's greatest musicals, some of the greatest paintings ever done, the Jackson Pollocks, the greatest, um, uh, uh, the, the great, some of the greatest literary works, some of the greatest stuff that was done came out of that period of time, as well as technological innovation, the brilliance of uh, uh, the Hewlett's and Packard's. And, and, uh, and, and so I'm fascinated by that stuff, which is kind of not really consistent with a guy who most, I don't know, maybe I'm being unfair to musicians as a whole, but uh, <clears throat> I, I really appreciate it when I can hook up with a pal who can sit down and we can talk about uh, Florence uh, Knoll's influence on design and furniture. And we can talk Mies van der Rohe and we can talk about Ray and Charles Ames and actually, you know, talk about the, the, um, the uh, uh, architecture, the buildings, the design, the innovation, things like that. Right? What's interesting is that your job, which is like a hobby for a guy like me, is a, is a kinesthetic, you know, a feeling based. All your hobbies are visual. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm definitely a visual guy. Really was, interesting. That was very I, interesting. Algebra. I could not grasp algebra in the abstract at all, which probably explains why I could never accept learning how to read music, because that's very much a mathematical yeah. brain that's making that happen. And yet, uh, geometry, I'm pretty good at. I can take a look at something and size it up and say, well, I think this is what's going to happen. So I'm a visual person. Yeah, but you got also, obviously you're also the auditory and the kinesthetic with the with yeah. the music. That's interesting, man. Well, I sit down. I, I used to drive people crazy in, in corporate meetings because I'd grab a piece of paper and say, look, this is what I'm talking about. It looks like this, you know. I don't know. <laughs> I'd say, here you go. Or I'd, I'd sketch a little Venn chart or something and say, this is what you do, you know. Can you see what I'm talking about? And they would all look at me like I had a, just grown up, third arm or something. Most important person in your life? My wife. How long have you all been together? Uh, coming up on 35 years. Congratulations. That's a major accomplishment, man. More than your yeah. more than your 150 gold and platinum records. She is the most important thing in the world to me. Next in line are my kids. Um, but uh, without my wife, uh, uh, probably none of this would have happened. Biggest business or personal win? Life. In general, good for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I go that way. The business wins are all just somebody keeping score. Uh, they're nice. Everybody wants to be successful. And we had successes with our recording studio, with Omnisound. I was very proud of that. We were like a little engine that could. But that's not my biggest achievements and the things I'll always want to be known for and remembered. I want to be remembered as a durable guitar player. And I want to be remembered as a guy who tried to be, you know, uh, who, who, you know, you, nobody puts up every point on the board, right? Everybody's got issues and ups and downs. But I hope that my success will be at trying just to deal with this whole game of life as we know it. Because it's... It's tough. It, it's challenging. It's a stumper. <laughs> yeah. Any bad habits? Don't exercise nearly enough. Uh, I think I've lost most of my bad habits. Uh, and everybody's got those through the course of their life, too. You just eventually figure out, well, no, that's not working so well anymore. <laughs> it's a low you know? ROI. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, and, uh, and you look at it. And again, it comes with the global effect of, of wisdom and getting a little older and understanding. And sooner or later, you, you look at your friends who've had bad habits and those around you and... There's a period where you think they're crazy and it's silly and they're fools. And and then one day you realize it's just sad. Yeah. You know, it can make you sad and you look at it and you say, boy, I'm glad I didn't go there. And I'm, I'm sorry that he or she went there, but they did. I don't know what I could have done to affect any change. But uh, no bad habits left other than 
you know, I probably sleep too late and I don't exercise enough and I still love sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you two more questions, man. I really appreciate all your time. Very generous, and I can't thank you enough. Um, first question is, is uh, have you ever had an experience that's changed your life, a specific experience that changed your life or altered the way you think about things? The loss of our son. I'm so sorry that you had to deal with that, man. And it's okay to leave that in. Um, we all deal with losses. I've lost uh, an older brother. I've lost my parents, um, all of which had some chipping away effect. At cha- It all changes who you are. But the loss of our oldest son really caused me to become a far more contemplative person, I hope, um, and... Uh, you know, I could go on. This is the whole other topic, and I don't want to get into you know my it, putting my beliefs into this interview so much as to try to force others to accept or even listen to them. Hmm. That's a big deal, though. Um, other life changing event? Yeah, the day I drove from Peoria, Illinois, to Nashville, Tennessee. You know, I thought you were going to say that actually. June fifth, nineteen seventy two. What was 60, it? June fifth. June fifth, nineteen seventy two, in a sixty eight Plymouth Roadrunner. Dude, your memory is pretty tech sharp. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> Last question, man. Uh, and again, I re- really enjoy this and I can't thank you enough. W- what has been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And how much of this change has been deliberate? And how much is a natural part of aging? I hope that the biggest change that I have made is patience. I hope that I've learned to become a more patient and a more open-minded person. I've still got my bad days like everybody else. When somebody says something, it will really piss me off. And I'm not perfect. You know, sometimes I'll react, but I try not to react. I try really to gauge my responses, to be patient, to understand that others may have an opinion that does not line up with mine. And it's hard to do, but eventually you've got to get to the point where you accept the reality that, you know, they might be right. Yeah, for sure. And when that's confirmed, then you have you've you've justified your thoughts and, and you know, you affirm your uh, uh, your belief and it's come to pass and that's good. So I, I hope that's where it is. I hope it continues to get better. And I think that's I hope that's the case with a. I wish that were the case for mankind, <laughs> but it's something that I try to remind younger musicians. It'll take them time. Uh, younger people, it, it, it takes all of us. Some people never get there. I may never get all the way there. I'm just doing the best I can. I put every foot, every day, the foot in front of the other. And, you know, that's all you can do, man. Gratitude. Be grateful. I think I'm more grateful now than I've ever been before. And, uh, uh you know, I, I've, I've said this before, that when you start out in a business like I've been in my whole life, you start with a, boy, you start with a great big bunch of ego. You got to, because you're coming in to prove that you're the new fast gun in town. You got to have some ego, because that's what's going to sustain you through the idea of saying, oh, I can do this. Hmm. You know, I'm your guy. <clears throat> you don't worry too much about, um, about dignity at that point, because, you, you know, somebody catches you. Uh, in a moment of very not dignified behavior, it tends to be forgiven as youthful exuberance. My aspiration here, as the years go by, is to wind up with exactly the opposite proportion, where I wind up with a whole bunch of dignity and a little tiny bit of ego. That's how I'd like to do it. I'd like to see those paths cross. I think they've already crossed. And uh, so if I can pull that off, I'll... I'll, uh, I'll be going away. I, I'm hoping I've still got a whole bunch more years to keep working on this because it's, it's it's a work in progress. Man, I'm sure you do. I'm <laughs> sure you do have a ton of time. Listen, I I, uh, I want to just tell a couple, some people, tell some people, <laughs> tell some people, tell us people where uh, some of the stuff you're involved in and, and to where they could find you. First of all, Steve's the music director again of the Grand Old Opry. Support the Opry. If you're in the Nashville or want to go to Nashville and see some good shows, he works very hard 
at trying to deliver a good performance. He's also responsible for the CMA Awards and the CMA Christmas Show, which have both won and been recognized in the industry. And he also is passionate about the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation out in California. And if you want to check that out, it's bbrfoundation.org. Man, I can't thank you enough for your time. I really, really appreciate it. You're so generous and candid. Um, any parting words of wisdom? No, uh, I, but I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for including me in this initiative. I think it's wonderful that you're doing it. Um, I applaud and admire you for doing good work here and, uh, and getting the documentation right from the various horses and their mouths. <laughs> um, thanks very much. It's been my pleasure and my privilege. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Feelings mutual. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. I, I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Listen to it again. There's a lot of good learning points in here on so many different areas about musicianship, business, and success, and uh, just being real. And thanks again to Steve Gibson for spending time with us. I genuinely appreciate it. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes along with some early product announcements. And remember, happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love, and I am out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.